I'm Emmy Lees, and welcome to the latest episode of Think Like a Vegan, a companion podcast to our book, also entitled Think Like a Vegan. In each episode, I'll explore one topic related to veganism, one that might not be the focus of an everyday conversation. Some we touched on in our book, and here we'll have the chance to take a closer look. I hope these short talks will inspire you and expand the conversation around veganism. Most people never think animals are considered merely property, like your phone or your car. But that's what it is. We talk about this in our book a little bit, showing how it also applies to wild animals, not just domestic or farm animals. In her book, Animals as Legal Beings, Professor Decca, who's our guest today, writes, Law serves as the newest explanation for why we as a species are different from other species and thus entitled to the privileges our current anthropocentric social, cultural, and economic order affords us. To say that humans and corporations are at war with animals is not to engage in hyperbole. Law facilitates this violence through the category of property, giving legal sanction and enforcement to a broader toxic culture that exalts human exceptionalism, normalizes anthropocentrism, marginalizes humans who do not conform to its paradigmatic person-slash-human, brutalizes animals en masse, and instrumentalizes and devastates other non-human beings. To alter this state of affairs, multi-layered and wide-ranging interventions from all corners of society will be required. Professor Decca's extraordinary and deeply sensitive work proposes an entirely new legal category, because the law still has a role to play to change the current paradigm, that of beingness. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Manisha Decca. I've had the pleasure to hear Professor Decca speak at a Global Research Network event, and I immediately bought her book that will be the subject of today's episode. The book's entitled Animals as Legal Beings, Contesting Anthropocentric Legal Orders. Professor Decca will be speaking to us about what it would look like to replace the property classification for animals to a new legal status she calls beingness. Welcome, Professor. Thank you so much, Amelia. It's a delight to be here. Fantastic to have you here. Really appreciate it. Before we hear from Professor Decca, here's a bit of background about her. Professor Decca is a professor and chair of uh, the Faculty of Law at the University of Victoria in Canada, where she also directs the Community Engaged Animals and Society Research Initiative. Her research topics include animal legal studies and critical animal studies, feminist animal care theory, and feminist analysis of law, sociolegal studies in general, and reproductive and end-of-life ethics. I want to read another short excerpt from your book, which I think brings the focus on the issue. If property is inherently exploitative and personhood is inherently anthropocentric, anthropocentric legal systems seeking to shift towards a multi-species orientation must respond to animals through a new transformative legal subjectivity. With that, Professor Decca, the floor is yours. Thank you. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional human territories of the Lekwungen peoples on which my university, the University of Victoria, stands, and the devastating impacts of colonialism here in what is known as Victoria, British Columbia, and also across Canada and other parts of the world. I think require from all of us a deep listening, unlearning, and reordering of values and priorities and really new behaviors. Relatedly and importantly, I also want to recall the animals and other non-human species who are indigenous to this territory and elsewhere, and whose fates have been fundamentally affected by the anthropocentrism that is constitutive of colonialism. Making this connection between anthropocentrism and colonialism and anthropocentrism and other forms of subordination has been a central departure point in my work in animal law. My approach to the law is one that believes that speciesism and anthropocentrism are intimately tied 
to the patriarchal and capital accumulating project of colonialism and empire building. And conversely, that colonialism and the sexism and racism on which it is premised are foundationally shaped by anthropocentrism and the devaluation of our relations with animals and really our devaluation of animals themselves. So in my work, I have taken up these questions about multiple forms of violence and marginalization. I explore how hierarchical systems are different, but also connected through the concepts of animality, species, and claims about rational actors and human exceptionalism. My approach is one that is very much influenced by the pathbreaking work of Professor Gary Francione, a law professor that um, many listeners will likely be familiar with, um, still teaching at Rutgers University Law School in the United States, who is known as an abolitionist scholar. Mr. Francione has very much um, critiqued the legal subjectivity of animals as property and calls the current system in anthropocentric legal orders like the legal order of the common law or even civil law, where animals are property, a system of legal welfareism. So this is where animals may be seen to have protections, for example, in the form of anti-cruelty statutes, most obviously. Um, but really, um, they don't. Uh, what those types of statutes uh, protect are really the rights of the human owners and corporate owners uh, that attach to the animals. Um, that is because animals are a legal numb subject. They're legal objects, property. And so you can't really take into account the welfare um, as these statutes purport to do, as uh, Professor Francian argues, um, in the system, it's already skewed very heavily against the animal. So although, as I was saying, my approach is one that is very much influenced by arguments against a system of legal welfareism, um, and I also explain why property is an untenable and exploitive classification for animals, or also agree with that position, it is a different approach. That's because it is also centrally shaped by feminist animal care theory, or what may also be known to listeners as vegetarian feminism, as it was called decades past, or perhaps today we can say vegan feminism, as well as the offshoot of critical animal studies from feminist animal care theory. Uh, feminist animal care theory brings very much a focus on interrelated value dualisms. For example, man over woman, culture privileged over nature, and the mind privileged over the body. And these are dualisms that come to us from um, uh, you know, Western Enlightenment thinking that are really, really entrenched in how um, the law is kind of set up. And we see that kind of reflected very much in our property personhood binary that we have. Um, so my approach is against property, but it's also one that takes into account the functioning of these dualisms and how they shape kind of legal debates about who matters and who doesn't. Another way of saying this is that I think it's also important not just to critique the property status of animals, but to link that status to the problems that many scholars, perhaps not only thinking about animals and thinking more about human rights issues, but that many scholars have you know, uh, illuminated about what the problems are of liberal humanism. So liberal humanism can be understood as an approach where um, certainly humans are valued, but it's a particular type of human, one that kind of works well in um, a liberal system of values. So this is someone who is presumed kind of facially neutral to be rational, to be independent, to be autonomous. But really when you unpack the history of liberal humanism and even how it works today, um, when we're supposedly all supposed to be, all humans are supposed to be seen as equal under the eyes of the law and before the law, it's really a system that privileges a certain type of human, one that I and others called a paradigmatic human. So again, to recap what I was saying, in addition to critiquing the property status of animals, I also want to critique the liberal humanist foundations of the law. So this allows me to kind of unpack the multiple nodes of violence 
and explore connections and synergies among them. That is essential to considering the animal question in law because really the oppression of animals is a multinodal system um, that sustain. And this is, so this kind of integrated system, I'm not just thinking about, you know, humans and animals, but thinking about issues of, for example, uh, gender and race and class and ability in relation to how we think about animals even, right? Or how we come to understand animals help sustain, in my in, um, thinking about this, the unfathomable levels and levels of tyranny and violence that animals endure today. So this theoretical outlook has led me to this endpoint, to eschew and denounce property as a just categorization for animals, as strongly as I believe abolitionist scholars like Professor Francione and um, you know, Professor Stephen Wise, who runs the Non-Human Rights Project, is increasingly known too. But it's also led me in my book, Animals as Legal Beings, to argue against personhood as the corrective, which is often seen as the corrective for right, the dismal or abysmal property status. Um, so I advance the theory in my book that personhood, while far preferable to property, is not as animal friendly as we might think because it's too tethered to the principles of legal humanism. So as elusive as the term personhood may be to define, and we know it is, it has multiple iterations in common law jurisdictions, even if we think of the UK or Australia or New Zealand or Canada, and we did a search, you know, about how do, how do judges, how do legislators talk about this term? But despite its multiple conceptualizations in the common law, more often than not, the concept of personhood is tethered to a certain idealized vision of what it means to be human, namely a highly rational, autonomous, and independent person. So, in other words, personhood animates a paradigmatic human that really most of us cannot emulate at some point in our lives or even through the entirety of our lives. I mean, just think of how we come into this world as babies. We are not this paradigmatic person. Many of us perhaps won't be ever this paradigmatic person. And perhaps when we leave this planet, we're not going to be this paradigmatic person. So in many ways, it's a fictional type of person. But as much as we might try to escape these liberal humanist features of kind of you know, hyper-rationality, autonomy, and independence of who is the ideal type of human or legal actor, advocacy that seeks personhood for animals as a corrective to property must always play a game whereby the standards for animals' admission to the personhood category depend on how much they can conform to the liberal humanist benchmarks of the human. Right, so perhaps the humanized animals in particular contacts, so maybe the cetaceans or the non-human primates, the elephants, perhaps they can succeed in this arena. But really, those animals that are never going to be seen to be highly rational, for example, intelligent, um, the ones that we often animalize, for example, the farmed animals, right, the ones that we eat, um, are not going to get the benefit of um, kind of you know, this, uh, the coveted status of personhood. Maybe some animals, but not um, all animals. And typically when we think about why farmed animals are animalized, we see that they are very gendered, right? And they are seen kind of to be very kind of feminine, female animals. And if we think of, you know, how the farming system works, we know that it relies on the reproductive capacities of females. And so there's a link here between kind of Issues of gender, issues of animality, for example, that really you know come to light if we think of kind of the, as I was saying before, multinodal nature of animal suppression. So, um, as a more universally animal-friendly corrective to property, one that I believe and I argue in my book holds more potential for the animalized animals to one day be freed from the captivity. I have offered the alternative of beingness. So in this classification, animals matter because they are one, embodied being, beings through their sentience and capacity for life. So they're embodied because many of them are sentient or even if we are, you know, they're not sentient, they have a capacity for life. And two, they're relational beings that are nested within families and networks. And so they matter because of this embodiment, because of this relationality, 
both of which give rise to three of vulnerability because they're always vulnerable to loss and injury due to those two previous capacities of embodiment and relationality. So just like humans, right, animals are vulnerable to feeling physical pain, for example, to being harmed in that way, or psychological trauma, or the devastation and just kind of the sub- imminent suffering, immediate suffering that comes from being separated um, from a child from her mother. Um, so I do not pretend, you know, or wish to kind of argue that beingness is some type of panacea or something that, you know, to take um, Curry's majority support from legislators or judges. But if we are entering legal arenas, um, you know, like personhood litigation projects or law reform seeking personhood are to make our case for animals, I see beingness as a more inclusive category for all animals with roughly similar chances of success as personhood to one day prevail. Because right now, I mean, we also know that personhood is not going to con- you know, be forthcoming for animals anytime soon in a grand scale. So we're really at this stage in this type of movement, legal and otherwise, of trying to make a radical change, whether it's personhood or something else like beingness. So if we're kind of in this, you know, blue sky, carte blanche type of arena, I say, why not something that is more animal friendly, right? We, we don't have a tight investment of personhood. Um, the legal system may, but actually that may backfire against animals because when you go into court or you go in front of a policymaker asking for personhood for animals, they're typically going to be, you know, holding an anthropocentric mindset, immersed in kind of, you know, what they know and the habits of their culture, which is human exceptionalism, most likely. And they might have a knee-jerk reaction to, well, I don't want to say animals are equal to humans. But um, so there are drawbacks of using personhood as well. And even if animals are seen to be persons, in addition to the issues of that I've spotlighted, of which animals are going to be favored, we might have a situation where you will just have an ongoing two-tiered system anyway between human persons, corporate persons, for example, and animal persons. So all of this is another way to say I don't think that there's much to be lost in this moment from using the discourse and the language of beingness versus personhood because we haven't gone so far down the personhood road that we're really doing a scaling back of protections for animals. Um, so that would be kind of another strategic or practical reason to, to consider um, beingness as something to kind of advance in the hope of, you know, it incorporating, encapsulating more animals than personhood could. We'll stop here for a short break and return with more from Professor Manisha Decca. Here's a magical soundscape from Derek Solomon. This was recorded in a massive temporary wetland during the height of the rainy season in Mashatu Game Reserve in Botswana. We're back for the second part of Anisha Decca's briefing on animals as legal beings. So does all of this mean, you know, to support something like beingness, does that mean that one cannot support kind of the growing number of personhood campaigns for animals or even other non-humans? Um, so a few of which have been, you know, kind of quote unquote uh, successful, but really if you kind of, you know, um, look at, the reasoning behind, let's say, personhood for some rivers or personhood for, you know, one or two animals in a certain jurisdictions, it can um, be explained as, you know, a very limited type of win, not something that's going to revolutionize that jurisdiction. Um, but does this mean that we shouldn't support any personhood projects? And um, so my answer to that is no, that's not what I'm 
arguing. Uh, I myself have been asked to, um, you know, intervene in uh, litigation campaigns where personhood is kind of the operative premise of what the um, advocacy is asking for for a particular animal. Um, but instead of promoting personhood, I do it. I kind of promote the ideas around personhood without using the limiting language of, um, you know, uh, of, of, of what I see as limiting language of emphasizing rationality or emphasizing autonomy or emphasizing the um, uh, kind of the independence of an animal. So I try not to use words or use language in kind of any legal submissions or policy submissions or even my scholarly submissions where uh, I'm saying an animal matters because they're really like a certain type of human. And so I do think it's possible in our everyday world, you know, in our advocacy to support personhood projects that are going forward, but, you know, to kind of use language that opens up people's minds to the other reasons why these beyond intelligence, for example, or mirror tests um, and those types of, you know, very, the capacities that are tied to long-standing benchmarks in kind of Western traditions of who should matter and why, um, who gets moral consideration and who doesn't, to get away from that kind of focus on intelligence to thinking about just the you know, animals mattering because of the three factors I mentioned, their embodiment, their relationality, and uh, the vulnerability that um, arises from that. Um, so my hope, of course, is that personhood will fall out of favor in terms of the legal ask and something like beingness or beingness itself will kind of be adopted so that we are, our minds are immediately kind of taken to those characteristics of why um, a being would matter, i.e. embodiment, relationality, vulnerability, rather than rationality, autonomy, and independence. Um, but in the interim, I think it is possible to kind of be supportive of campaigns that are happening for animals as we try also just to tweak our language and emphasize different uh, priorities. Another issue I'd like to discuss is, you know, well, what does all this mean, um, you know, even for humans? And perhaps, you know, a very common question is, well, why just animals? What about other non-humans and, you know, specifically plants, for example? Let's think about them and what, you know, why am I not talking about other non-humans who obviously can also be embodied, relational, and then vulnerable? So let me just address these two issues. You know, I've said that personhood is not an animal-friendly category because of liberal humanism and this idea of the paradigmatic human that is also kind of, you know, always haunting the question of personhood, even as much as you don't need to be even a human being to receive personhood. We know that corporations have been legal persons for, um, you know, over uh, several centuries. Um, yeah, we also know from scholarship on personhood by personhood scholars that this liberal humanist version of personhood or what some scholars call the rationalist version of personhood is really, really strong. And that's not just a problem for animals. That has been the problem for many groups of subordinated humans historically and in a, in a continuing way. Like we can just even think of human children right, who do not meet this benchmark. And so wouldn't, you know, tossing out the personhood category make sense for humans? And so I mean, you know, my reaction is to say, um, yes, it would, but that wasn't the focus of my book or focus of my argument. And certainly there have been other scholars who impugned the personal category just for, you know, uh, women or even kind of the um, uh, uh, AI uh, technology that is forcing us to confront, you know, how are we treating different types of non-humans? And so um, my point here is being the critique on, leveraging against personhood can be applicable in other contexts, even to human beings, although that wasn't my um, point in the book. And of course, there is a bit more to lose with respect to human beings because we have legal formal recognition of personhood for humans. So that's another point to consider that is quite different from what I said about animals. But I'd like to turn me to perhaps the other way to think about other non-humans and really plants, you know, in this era of like, um, you know, increasing awareness about climate change, about uh, carbon emissions and, you know, the role of trees, for example, in being our kind of, you know, prime hope for reversing um, uh, 
the kind of state of the planet and the warming of the planet if we you know stop killing them um why not you know being is for plants as well and so um or what about being is for plants so one of the chapters of the book um really takes on this question, which I see, you know, generally in the animal scholarship is quite under theorized. Um, and understandably so, you know, many animal scholars um, in law and otherwise have been very focused on making the case and convincing others as to why animals matter and what that should mean in terms of policies and protections. Um, and uh, so thinking about, well, you know, what would a different legal subjectivity be for other non-humans or should there be a different one is a kind of a newer question. And I do take this up in the book just to kind of clarify my position that I also think the property categorization for, for um, trees, for example, and other plants is not the appropriate classification. Um, there are very exploitive relations, not just between human and animals, but between humans and trees um, and other plants. At the same time, I don't extend the category, uh, the new legal category of beingness that I'm proposing for animals because beingness is meant to be as protective a category for animals as personhood would be for them. So, you know, what is that level of protection? Well, it's supposed to be a protection from harm, even where it might benefit the overall public good or, um, as, uh, you know, a few other people you know, might benefit even a few other people more than one person. You are not supposed to be kind of exploited by anyone else unless you consent to that, right? Um, or unless you, you know, sell your labor for a kind of specific employer. This is the power of personhood. Now we know kind of personhood just it's a it's a theoretical abstract um, in the lives of many humans, and it's not properly implemented and actualized. We can think of you know, the precarity of so many people across the world living in poverty and uh, especially the children in poverty um, and not being able to even live through the day because they're not having their needs met. So it's not that personhood is a panacea for humans either, but at least legally, there's supposed to be protection against being used by others, being instrumentalized by others and being, including being killed by others, not so for animals. Um, beingness is meant to be that kind of hard stop as well, right? From that type of instrumentalization, um, you know, torture, abuse, or death. Um, but that is also the reason, even though I think the law needs to respond much more, much better toward non-humans like plants and trees, I don't extend the category of beingness to this category of non-humans, i.e. plants such as trees, because um, of the just you know reality that animals and humans need to eat plants and so um vis-a-vis -vis human relations i don't want to extend beingness to any type of entity that we need to kill because i don't want being as a, you know to be diluted to be really just kind of a humane measure or some type of you know welfare measure it's supposed to be a hard stop disallowing the corporations today and the humans today who um, kill animals for whatever, you know, ostensibly benign human purpose, it's still very harmful to animals um, from engaging in that behavior. And so that's why I don't extend beingness uh, to plants because it's, it, 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 we would still need a system where we are instrumentalizing plants um, to eat them. And again, we can explain that, um, but it's still, you know, to the plant, it's still a death. And so that's why beingness is not um, something that I extend to plants, even though I hope in that chapter I've tried to explain why the rationale not to is not like a liberal humanist rationale. Rather, I've you know, put it in the kind of logic of feminist animal care theory in terms of understanding another critical theory um, in terms of kind of drawing that line. Um, so really, the critique of the whole argument in animals as legal beings is meant to, you know, stimulate conversation about how um, binary and the legal orders that place animals uh, in a property category really need to change um, to kind of catch up with the increasing kind of you know scientific. Um, evidence and increasing consciousness, you know, throughout the world that we need, you know, brought on by uh, gro growing global awareness about climate change, but also our 
very recent and ongoing reality of synodic pandemics, um, to understand that we need much more harmonious relations with animals and that the legal system is really um, one of the linchpins in a system that is not enabling those harmonious relationships to occur. And of course, there's enormous and economic pressures undergirding the legal system, but we really need like a, a leading role played by law because sometimes society follows legal changes. And of course, sometimes it's the other way around. So we have to work both ways. But there is really a critical role for legal systems to play to change, um, to reevaluate the kind of objectification for animals, give them a much different accounting, understand not that we just like them because they're similar to humans, but understand that they matter in of themselves because of their embodiment, their relationality and vulnerability, and um, work to implement, you know, with the necessary social transitions that will have to be put in place to move people from animal use industries to non-exploitive ways of interacting with animals. Um, the law will can then help move us all to that new place. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Decca. That was uh, absolutely brilliant and and so thought provoking. Um, yours is such important work, and there's so much in your critique that challenges and deepens my understanding on this issue, especially with respect to personhood and sentience, particularly coming from having read um, pretty much all of Professor Francione's work. It's, it was extremely exciting to me to hear you speak um, the first time I heard you speak and, and, and now as well, to see an evolution of that uh, and, and really bringing those concepts, but just, uh, I don't even want to say exploding them in a different, but, but taking them to a, to a different, to something different and so inclusive. And it's, it's just, just very exciting. Um, so, so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, I wish your book had been published when we were writing ours because it would have certainly influenced some of the things that some of the mentions, some of our mentions, and some of uh, some of the things that that we touched upon. So um, maybe maybe in another in another edition. Um, thank you. Um, but that. before we go, uh, where can people follow your work, uh, whether online or otherwise? And do you have any projects that you'd like to promote? Yes. Well, um, in terms of projects, that they're still ongoing, but you know, when they're ready, um, they, we will be marking it, and I hope people will, you know, um, go to the websites that I will mention as well um, to find out more. So, current project is actually a documentary series that I'm doing through the support of the Brooks Institute um, for Animal Rights Law and Policy, and all the wonderful participants who are um, have agreed to participate. And so this is um, meant to be, really, it's a, first of all, a, a, a pilot, and if it goes well, we hope to extend it. But it will be an open, it's meant to be an open access documentary that um, uh, middle school teachers, high school teachers, perhaps even early undergraduate um, courses, instructors for courses, um, you know, in educational institutions in every jurisdiction, um, English speaking, can uh, latch onto to show in their classes um, to students to help educate people about how the law's legal system is falling short in protecting animals. I think many people feel like animals are well protected, and um, this documentary kind of, you know, explains why they're not. But we do so in a really kind of, you know, youth responsive, hopefully, way in promoting the activism, animal activism of various youth, and how they've been able to make a difference, you know, in their schools and in their communities on different issues with respect to farmed animals, animals in research, um, animals in other forms of captivity otherwise. So when that is ready, we really hope to distribute it, distribute it as wide and far so we can get kind of maximum attention and integration into classes. I must say that, you know, I speak to adults very much so, and, and that's important work, but I really think the future of um, change for this movement and so many others is with um, I with, with children, really, at their earliest possible time um, to kind of um, stop those uh, kind of adulting type of uh, mindsets from encroaching on them that they shouldn't identify with animals, that they should, you know, 
commodify animals and should objectify animals because I think many children don't come into the world with those types of attitudes toward animals. Um, and uh, another project is uh, one that is very kind of legally immersed. It is um, thinking about someone like animals as legal beings, thinking about how uh, to take uh, the current legal system and make a change for animals, um, partly by working with the system. So even though animals for legal beings, that proposal is suggesting a new subjectivity, it's still one that's integrated in the current system. This project is a rule of law project. As listeners may know, the term the rule of law is very influential in the legal system because of you know the, the British Empire and, and how much it grew and spread. And it's also very influential in non-legal circles, in development work circles, for example, and uh, other international work circles. And so this project is thinking about, you know, can the rule of law be, despite its imperial baggage and its ongoing associations, actually be mine to because of its incredible take up and resonance with, with legal thinkers and policymakers to pr prompt, to pr um, stimulate governments in protecting animals instead of, for example, with farmed animals, leaving it so much up to the industry as to what they're going to do in terms of their industry norms. And so if we think of societies that are governed by the rule of law, why is it that so many animal use industries get to decide their own norms and we don't have um, kind of more public uh, norms about how animals are treated. So um, that's another project I'm really excited about, and some you know, the publications are slowly trickling out for that. Um, so, but to stay abreast on both, I would encourage listeners to go to um, two websites. Uh, the first is my own. Um, everyone can find me at the University of Victoria Faculty of Law website. I also maintain. Another website, which is, you know, online academic community, all, you know, three words all together, online academic community dot uvic dot ca slash, and then my name together, Manisha Daka forward slash. And the second website is also an online academic community that the UVic, um, University of Victoria maintains. So again, this second one is online academic community dot uvic dot ca forward slash. ASRI and ASRI stands for Animal Society Research Initiative. So this is a research initiative for which I'm, you know, it's kind of a grassroots initiative um, of myself and, and other interested um, former students, and alum, um, uh, and uh, current students, uh, just researching critical animals, you know, studies, feminist animal studies issues on campus. We run lecture series. We've done like an emerging scholars program. We run a newsletter. So if anyone would like to stay abreast on what Animal Society Research Initiative is doing, please join our newsletter. And certainly any of my projects get featured there as well. Fantastic. And we'll make sure, I'll make sure that all of these links are, are up on the on all the written materials and on the website and everything like that. So, so listeners will be able to find them. No problem. Um, thanks again. Really appreciate your time. In this episode, we've explored how changing the classification of animals under the law could help shift our relationship, not just with animals, but how we view our place in the world. Anthropocentrism or a human centered world in that classic pyramid image with man at the top isn't sustainable. It never was. We need to do better and have a broader view of, on how we can all thrive. And by all, I mean all people, animals, plants, and fungi. Next time, Professor Sherry Kolb will enlighten us on animal rights and reproductive rights. What are the moral considerations they share? And do they diverge? When we go around, we burn things up when we go around. That's it for me, Emmy Lees. Thank you for listening. I'll post a transcript in due course, along with links and references to the materials we've discussed today on our website, thinklikeavegan.com, and the audio will also be available on Think Like a Vegan YouTube channel. Remember, you can get in touch by email at thinklikeavegan.book at gmail.com or find Think Like a Vegan on most social media or find me at emmysgoodeating.com and on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. 
Subscribe to this podcast, share it with others, and leave us a review. And for our book, Think Like a Vegan, it's on bookshop.org or anywhere you buy books, and on your favorite audiobook platform, too. Or ask your local library to carry it. Production credit goes to Jim Moore of Bloody Vegans Productions. Music provided by Jenny Moore's Mystic Business. The opening tune is Flashbacks, and we close with Tear Things Up. <laughs>